Good morning. I am Pastor Jim Heckman, and I am the latest rendition and the last rendition of a bridge pastor here at St. John's in Ridge Valley. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I want to start off by thanking uh, Kathy and Marge and Linda and um, Mark uh, for being here in-house today uh, to keep me on track. And uh, we are especially grateful that you have tuned in out there in the virtual world. Maybe it's a little later if you uh, didn't remember to set your clock ahead, but that's okay. We're happy you joined us, whatever it is. And I'll remind you that later on in the service, we're going to have an opportunity to receive communion. And hopefully you've already got available or have readily handy uh, your little bit of bread and your wine or grape juice as you will prefer to use. There are a couple of announcements uh, that I do want to make. Uh, maybe most importantly, uh, we're finally going to be having the uh, 2021 Congregational Meeting. Um, it, besides uh, the turmoil of the change in pastorates, the COVID and the snowstorms, uh, it was difficult to get on the schedule, but we finally have done that. We are going to be having the Congregational Meeting on Palm Sunday. Uh, and that is uh, the last weekend in March. Actually, that uh, is going to be the start of a good weekend, a good week for us. That's the beginning of Holy Week. And uh, our plan right now is to have some together worship. Now, it's going to be outside, uh, but it, we're looking to put some tents together. So it'll be rain or shine. And, uh, uh, and uh, it will, you'll hear more about that, but they'll... The Palm Sunday service, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter will all be outside, although we will be still making it available to those who, who don't feel comfortable coming out. We're still going to have something available for you over the internet, so uh, lots of opportunities to, to join with St. John's family in worship that, that week. But again, the congregational meeting will follow that outside service uh, on that Palm Sunday, um, and there will be some light lunch refreshments. So uh, one of the things I can always count on whenever I go to a Lutheran church is that people do like to eat. So I have no doubt that you'll look forward to that as I do. Um, as we go through the service, there might be something else that I forgot that I'll announce along the way, but um, I ask you to, to bear with me as I get to know your routine and pattern. Um, the other thing I will remind folks of is um, you have the easy job. You only have one new name to remember, Pastor Jim. Or I do answer to PJ, too. I have a bigger problem, and that's remembering all of your names. And it's more complicated these days because when I only see there's much of you, uh, it's hard to you know, put everybody together. So I, please don't be offended if I have to ask you your name the second, third, fifth time. Okay? Uh, and. Uh, Plus the fact I'm getting older, so the memory ain't what it used to be. Let's be perfectly honest about that. Okay, I think that's... Oh, now I know there was one other one that's on the back page of the bulletin. Uh, the um, opportunity to order flowers for Easter uh, is... The, the deadline is Tuesday. Uh, so if you would like to, to order some flowers, um, you need to get on that. Okay, I think that's it then. So let us begin our time of worship together as we confess our sins and we hear God's words of redeeming grace. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Father of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing blood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow in the way of Jesus. As healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace, 
by the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to sing, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Serpent of bronze and live. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we read responsibly Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for the God is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. The second reading is from Ephesians, second chapter. While we were dead in our sinfulness, God acted to make us alive as a gift of grace in Christ Jesus. We were saved not by what we do, but by grace through faith. Thus, our good works are really a reflection of God's grace at work in our lives. The second reading. You were dead through trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the curse of the world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have saved, been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel today is from uh, St. John. To explain the salvation of God to the religious leader Nicodemus, Jesus refers to the scripture passage quoted in today's first reading. Just as those who looked upon the bronze serpent were healed, so people will be saved when they behold Christ lifted up on the cross. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that, he would, that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, something a little new we're going to have. 
behalf uh, that, I'm, that I'm here. Uh, we're going to have a children's message at this point in the service. Uh, and uh, now you older children, adults, you're allowed to listen in. But I want to speak uh, kind of directly to the young people uh, of the congregation. You probably, if you're children, you guys didn't read my letter, so you don't know anything really about me, and that's okay. But uh, I can tell you that uh, my wife is a physician assistant. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a person who uh, works alongside a doctor. And uh, she works in a dermatology practice. That's why I have such nice skin. But uh, uh, she um, is a medical practitioner. And uh, so is my son, who happens to be a doctor. And, and maybe you have seen something familiar if you've gone to the doctor's office. Now, my wife has this that's a symbol that represents who she is. And if you can see that, can you see that? Okay. A little closer. Okay. Now that. That's the physician's assistant symbol. And if you notice, in the middle, you see something that looks like wings on a post and something twisted around it. Now, you might see that symbol if you have looked at a, maybe a nurse or a doctor or some, like, first responders have them, uh, medical technicians. They have this symbol or something similar to it in their symbols, too. Now this, that's a little easier to see. And lo and behold, what do they look like? If you look closer, it's the post and wings and snakes. How about that? Does that sound anything like what we heard in our first lesson for today? Well, it sure does, because that's where they come from where Moses went to God because the people were complaining. They were getting bitten by snakes. And so God said, Moses, put a bronze serpent on a post and put it in the midst of the community. And when people get bitten, they look at it and they'll be healed. And that symbol now has come down through all this time and still medical professionals use it. It's called a caduceus, okay? Next time you go to the doctor and you see one, you can say, ah, doc, I know where that comes from. You may not remember it's a caduceus, but you might remember that it had to do with Moses and God, okay? Well, I show you that because, you know, we're in a terrible time right now with this, with this illness, huh? It's pretty bad. Haven't been able to go to school regularly. It's been kind of confusing. Wouldn't it be great if we could have something we could look up to, maybe if we had a big bronze uh, hypodermic needle for the vaccine, if we looked at that, would that heal us? Yeah, it would look funny. It might be interesting, but I don't know that it will heal us in the same way. Because you see, God knows that it's not just about looking at some statue, but we're reminded in our gospel lesson that instead of that serpent being lifted up to heal the world, that Jesus was lifted up on a staff to heal the world. And that reminds me of another of my favorite pictures. It's a picture by Salvador Dali, the artist, and it's this one. Now the thing I love about this is this was Many, many years ago, back in the 1980s, this picture of Salvador Dali's was put on posters, and underneath it said, God so loved the world that he gave his son. And you see, that's the cross with Jesus on it, over the earth. That's what's at the bottom. It's a little hard to see, maybe. But Google it. Have your parents Google it. You can look at it online. That's Jesus up on the post, over the world, saving us. So that's what we are here about. That for us, when 
we have illness and suffering, there is a place we can lift up our eyes for healing and strength is to Jesus on the cross. Let's have a little prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for using symbols like the caduceus to remind us that what we do in life is connected to you. And we also thank you that you sent your son to be lifted up on that cross so that we might know healing and life is real. Amen. I did remember there is one other announcement I wanted to make. It's a plea for help. Um, Kathy has been the bulwark of getting this live over the air. Um, but she has this thing called a job that she has to do it sometimes on Sunday mornings. Now, they've been recording a lot on Friday nights, but we'd like to be able to get back to live broadcasts on Sunday morning. And she has graciously adjusted her schedule to be here. But she really, we really would love to have somebody help out. And so I want to talk to you, particularly you younger people, because you guys know how to do this stuff really easy. People my age, we barely recognize how to turn on the phone, okay? But if you would like to help out here at St. John's, make part of your ministry, part of your stewardship, and you'd like to volunteer, give the office a call, give Kathy a call directly, and just say, you know, if we could get three or four people, we could rotate it so it wouldn't have to be every week. Okay. So if you're interested, please shout it out. Let us know. Don't expect us to read your mind. We're not very good at that. Thanks. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I don't think it's too big of a stretch to imagine that we all, as a world, can really relate to where the Israelites were at the time of Moses in our story from the first lesson. It's a very frustrating time. We feel like we've been in the wilderness and it's only been a year. There's that desire to want to kind of get going, get back. And we don't maybe understand what the problem is. Compound that here at St. John's with the fact that you've been in the process of trying to find a new shepherd for longer than a year. And different things happen and you wonder, has God forgotten us? Now, in the case of the Israelites, when they questioned whether God was still there, who did they go to? Who did they blame? Moses. You know, he was the one who God took all the flag. Well, in the modern church, we have a different way. You know, we don't blame Moses when things go slowly in the midst of looking for a new pastor. We blame the sin. Yes, it's always the sin's fault. And, uh, you know, I understand that uh, I've been uh, in the ministry a long time, and I have been involved in call processes where uh, I've been on the other side. And I agree, it seems to take forever. But one of the things I've always felt is that if we trust in God, the Holy Spirit does work. And uh, we may not always get it when we think it ought to happen, but sometimes it's not about casting blame. I think the thing to remember is the synod, like Moses, even though it's always accused of being a troublemaker, continues to work on your, on your behalf. Just like Moses continued to work on behalf of the people of Israel. And he goes to God with their complaints. And I just want to look back on those words. He says, why have you brought us, or they, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now, you have to remember that the Israelites were brought out of Egypt because they had been in slavery there for 400 years. They complained they wanted to be set free. So God heard their call. God sent Moses. God went through that whole process of training Moses to make sure he was right, ready for the task. Moses comes back. Pharaoh will let him go. Moses goes through the ten plagues, which don't touch the Israelites in any way. Pharaoh finally relents. They're out. They're on their own. They come to the Red Sea. They think they're going to drown. Moses says, nope, 
where God says, nope, and tells Moses how to hit that, rock, uh, hit that staff up so that the water divides and they go through, gets them out, sets them free. Then they no sooner get out in the wilderness and the people start complaining already. What's there to eat? What's there to drink? Well, once again, God provides the man from heaven, the quail, and he turns on the faucet on the rock. That's a plumbing trick. So much water to feed all and take care of all those people. And day after day, he does that. He leads them back to Mount uh, to Sinai, where they spend about a year at the foot of that mountain while Moses goes up, gets the Ten Commandments, comes down, they have that incident with the golden calf, and Moses loses his cool and costs him the ability to go into the Promised Land. But they get that squared away, and the Ten Commandments are delivered, and they're starting out on their journey. Now, they've still got 39 plus years to go, but God has made the promise. God continues to provide for them. But look what's happening. Why have you brought us up again out of Egypt? After all that stuff, they still want to go back to Egypt. They still want to go back to Egypt. For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. But wait a minute. Didn't they just say there's no food? Oh, I see the problem. It's not that there wasn't food. It's just they didn't like it. They were bored with it, I guess. I mean, I could eat pizza every day for 40 years, couldn't you? Well, they did have quail on the weekends. But they didn't. They did have. God provided. But they didn't like the way God provided. They wanted something different. So what does God do? Well, we kind of see the human side of God right here. He sends poisonous serpents among the people. Now, it's interesting. Where did these serpents come from? You see, I think one of the things the people of Israel don't recognize is that God has been protecting them all along. Poisonous serpents in the desert is in the shock. That's their home. That's where they are. The fact that they hadn't been biting and killing people before this is the unusual part. Now, for you Science 5 fans, maybe you're a Star Trek fan as I am, if you think about it this way, that is the people of Israel came out into the wilderness and God had put a force field down over them, okay? To keep those things away that were harm, to be harmful to them. But they're complaining. So what does God do? God basically says, okay, do you want to see what it's like without my protection? Whoop! There goes the, there goes the force field. And just let nature take its course. And so these serpents come in, and they're biting the people, and they're dying. Now, there's an interesting, another interesting element about these serpents. And as I showed the, the young people, the caduceus, that word that's used in Hebrew is translated into Greek as the word, um, oh, my mind just went blank. Uh, it's, a, it's a word for seraphim. You know the angels? Well, there's actually two set kinds of angels we hear about in the scripture. Cherubim and seraphim. Cherubim are actually lion, lions uh, angels. Kind of lions with wings. Kind of different from the cherubic picture we have of angels from Valentine's Day. But the words uh, um, for the other kind of angel... The seraphim is this same word. They are snakes, winged snakes, angel snakes. Now it's interesting, isn't it? That when we go out and we see, see things happening in our life, we say, that's of the devil, that's snake, you know? It's, but we, maybe what we need to recognize is what we're seeing is the reality of our own sinful world. You see, what we don't like to look at, what we don't like to acknowledge is we're in our own mess. It's our own sinfulness that has created these problems. It was the lack of, of, of acknowledging God 
that got the people of Israel in trouble. And so God had to get their attention. He, in essence, had to allow them to hold a mirror in front of themselves so they could see and acknowledge that they had fallen away from their promise to be faithful, trusting in God. And let's face it, that sometimes happens with us. We forget about our relationship with God, our pledge and our faithfulness to God to do what God would have us do, not what I think ought to be done. So, the people begin to die. So the people once again come to Moses and say to him, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord. You know, isn't that the most difficult thing for us to do when we find that we have uh, uh, an addiction of some kind? What's the first, in the, if any 12-step program? To acknowledge that you are addicted. Maybe we ought to begin church. Hi, my name's Jim and I am a sinner. But that's hard, isn't it? We don't like to acknowledge that. We think somehow, simply by walking in the doors of the church, that eradicates that. Well, it's a little bit more than that, but that's for another sermon. But they acknowledge, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. You see, that's what we want. You know, God, just turn on that, turn on that force field again, okay? Just send it back the way it was. And, you know, maybe even just send us back to Egypt. <laughs> But God doesn't do that. He tells Moses to put that serpent up on a post to be a reminder. And the serpents are still there. They're still biting people. It's a way to remind us of our sinfulness and the need for our repentance and turning back to God. That's the challenge, you see. If we are willing to acknowledge our repentance and continuing to be faithful to God so that we might be able to be saved, to move forward, to go on to that promised land. They had a long journey ahead. Now, some of you may have been on a long journey and you may wonder when it will ever end. And I certainly am hopeful that my bridge pastorate right here can be one of the shortest tenures ever recorded in history. But that doesn't mean that we sit and do nothing. Indeed, sometimes we forget that we still have work to do. For those of you who got my email introductory letter, you saw that I talked about the function of a bridge pastor was to move us over that bridge. I got one response back from one of the parishioners here who made an interesting observation, and maybe some others share it. It was that, um, Yes, they do feel like they're on a bridge, but they feel like it's a drawbridge and the road's been lifted up and everything's come to a halt. I understand that feeling and others may share it. And maybe that's the way you feel. And that concerns me in a sense because it almost makes it easier to say, let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just go back to the way it was. I remember a seminary professor once said to, to our class, every church has a back to Egypt committee. We kind of, what do you mean a back to Egypt committee? Well, there's always a group within the church that always want to go back to the way it was. But the problem with that is we forget the way it was really. In Egypt, there was slavery. It was the, uh, the no freedoms. They weren't free to worship God. The same thing is true when we look back into our history of any church. Yes, there's some glorious times, but there were problems too. And in the churches, when you were healthy, you were growing. You were moving towards that. You were taking your strengths, moving forward, and you were trying to put your weaknesses behind you. And that's what needs to happen today. Not just a wanting to do a U-turn and go back home because the drawbridge might be up and it's a little difficult to get down and crossing again. But that's what we are to be in the church. We are to be a people who are moving forward to that promised land. I hope that during my time here that we can get a feeling like the drawbridge is down and that we're moving across 
And so soon, when you hit the other side in a new place, that you won't want to go back to the way it was, that you will be excited about the way it is and the way it will be. That's something we find joy in because what draws us to the other side is the cross. That cross that just like the bronze serpent on the statue is there to remind us that we are sinners. That's why Jesus is on that cross. But it also reminds us as we look at it, we turn our heads to it. It reminds us that because of Christ on the cross, we have forgiveness. We have renewed hope. And we do know that that time is coming, that we will be on the other side of the bridge, and that in Christ's name, we will be enriched. Amen. And our hymn, I think, is Amazing Grace. All right. Send your Son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry. Our ELCA, Global Partner Churches, and Young Adults in Global Mission. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. 
Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustain your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought. Bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick, especially Barlett Frederick, Ed Galgon, Vicki Gunst, Andy Hopkins, Lori Hopkins, Michael McIntyre, and comfort those who mourn especially for the families of Carl Nurm and Patrick Harrigan. Hear us, O oh. Your mercy is great. By grace we have been saved. Fill this congregation to overflowing with that grace, that we show mercy to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry, especially children, and bless our ministries of feeding and shelter. Give us patience and courage when the way seems long. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your Son was lifted up, that whoever believes might have eternal life. We praise you for all who have died in Christ. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves in all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Take an opportunity to share the peace with those who you are with today, and uh, uh, we hope that we'll be able to share peace well across the, the, the area.
bread and your wine or grape juice available and ready as we enter into our time of communion. We are indeed holy, gracious, and merciful God. Everything is filled with your glory. We give you thanks for your promise and presence which has sustained us, the faithful, in this and every generation. Above all, we give you thanks for Jesus, born of Mary, who in word and deed announced your gentle rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his command to love one another, his life and death, his resurrection and ascension, we pray for his coming again, and we pray in the words that he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. body of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Amen. We will conclude our worship with the singing of my hope is built on nothing less. Thank you.
Let us go in peace to share the good news. Thanks be to God. <laughs>